on that post-it note today. No matter what it is, no matter how personal it is, the Word of God teaches me that Jesus Christ is the one who can make it right. So tonight, 6 o'clock again, I encourage you to join us for prayer. Beginning of 2018, here we are. Most of us reminisce a little bit, beginnings of the year. So I'm going to reminisce just for a moment. This January starts us like at eight and a half years that Cassie and I have been honored to be your pastor. Let me tell you, we love you. We love this community. We love what God has done. He has been faithful to us as a church. It's been a fun ride the eight and a half years. Buckle up again, because I believe the future is going to be even better. Doesn't mean easy. Doesn't mean smooth sailing. But I believe God has something even more for us as a body of believers. So, you know, I've been reminiscing over the past few days, just kind of thoughts of the first few days, the first few years, the middle years, the later years. It's sad I'm at that point, the later years. It sounds like I'm 88 years old, like Lonnie. <laughs> Happy birthday a few days ago, Lonnie. The best is really still to come as we together do the work God has called us to do. We're in a series talking about some resets that need to happen in our life. Last week, we talked about physically doing some resets. And the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about some relational and some spiritual resets that we need to do. But today, I want us to look at, well, resetting financially. Oh, no, it's that Sunday. That's what you're thinking right there. I knew it. I want us to look at this as the way God has set up generosity and the blessing that it truly is in our lives. You know, I thought I might be starting in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and studying for today, but doing a little pre-reading and in chapter 8, I was thinking, you know what? The appetizer is just as good as the main course, so if we get to chapter 9 today, we get to chapter 9, but we're going to be in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians today. And before we jump into that, this past Sunday night at our 21 days of prayer, <coughs> I encouraged those who attended to pray for the needs that they came to pray for, but also to pray for two specific things as well. And I just want to share that with you this morning. One is from Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 21, and it reads this way. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Now, verse 21 was the key verse for the prayer I was asking them to pray. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now, as you might think as a pastor, you might think I'm focusing on and a lot of people turn to the Lord. That's not the part that I'm going to focus on. The hand of the Lord was with them. That's my prayer for me. That's my prayer for all of us, that as we go through life, that the hand of the Lord, he guides and directs us. The second prayer I challenged the people to pray was Jeremiah chapter 15, 16. Jeremiah's having a rough time. Anybody ever have a rough time? Raise your hand. Yep, that's all of us. The rest of you are liars. We need to pray about that later. It reads this way. When your words came, he's speaking of the words of the Lord. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. Not only do we need the hand of the Lord, but we need a word from the Lord for our lives. So that's our prayer. As we're starting this new year, if you, if you couldn't be here last Sunday night... I'm, you're now part of the group, meaning the hand of the Lord in our lives and a word from the Lord. So I've been praying, God, speak to me. What, what do I need to hear from you? For me, Sunday night and earlier this week, these are the two passages, just to let you know that I believe God's spoken to my life. 
Zechariah 4, 6. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Fun name to say. Not by might, nor my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And another passage that spoke to me this week, Joshua 3, 5. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Let me ask you a question this morning as we get started into our, our message. How many of you want to do something amazing for God? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. If you want to do something, now keep it up if you, I think I might. How many of you want to do something amazing for God? Okay, you look at those people, put your hands down. I just tricked you. That's not your job. That's God's job to do the amazing. Our job is to consecrate ourselves, to commit ourselves, to surrender ourselves completely to God. If we do our job, God is going to do his job. I believe he will show up in areas of your life. He'll provide for you. He'll do great things for you. If we consecrate, commit, dig in deep in following and obeying God. A reset. Maybe today you need a reset Maybe with that thing that's in your wallet, your credit card, your debit card, some of you have cash, not many of you. A lot of families, couples, beginning of the years, talk about calendar and budgets because they're kind of preparing for the new year. What are we going to do? How Calendar. And budgets. You know, the thing that just is the best thing for all coupled relationships, no tension when it comes to calendars or budgets, you know, that easy conversation you have with the ones you love the most. I want us to look at resetting financially from the scriptures with, with our budgets. Now, disclaimer, I'm not a financial planner, nor do I plan to be one, but I believe God wants us to plan for things that come in our life, and he gives us things to bless us, and he wants us to plan on how we use those things. The way that Cass and I, we budget, may not be the best way that you budget, but doing the process helps us. Because if we don't plan, we're just planning to fail. We're just planning to let money come in, money go out, not sure what it's going to do, not do what God wants us to do with it. So I want us to look from God's word today about planning. Because if you don't plan, you won't do it. If you don't have a Bible reading plan, I'm going to bet you right now, you're not going to read much this year. Let's be real. Let's be honest. Because uh, when I feel like it, trust me, you don't feel like it all the time. You have your little reminder on your phone with your version app, or you have the little thing in your Bible, and it reminds you to check off this day I've read or this topic I've read about. If you have a Bible reading plan, I bet you if you do at least for that first month, you'll be farther along than reading God's Word than you would ever be if you don't have a plan. If you don't have any intention of doing it, if you don't have a plan, you won't follow through. What you don't plan won't happen. Same thing goes with our lives and following God with this thing called money. So we can go ahead, we can make more money, spend less income, expense sides of the budget we could look at, but that's not what we're going to look at. I want to look today at the thing that drives us in life. I believe the key to helping us with finances in 2018 is to reset how we think about it. I believe the part that God has designed for us to enjoy the most is the giving part of the equation. He talks about it's more blessed. It's more happy. You will be more happy to give rather than to receive. I would challenge us in this day of kind of it's all about me. I would challenge you to not give until it hurts. 
but give until it's so much fun you can't stop. Blessed, happy, generous. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. That's where we'll start. And it reads, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. Pause with me for a second. Church family, I just want to tell you for the past few years, us as a church body, you have exceeded my personal expectations when it comes to generosity. Church, we have become a very generous church. Yesterday, two or three groups from our church went out just to be generous and kind and helpful to other people. I understand, I get it when you drop your offering, your check in the bag, or you give your tithes and offerings online. I get it. It is not money that you are giving. It is your life. You traded your time. You traded your talent. You did something to earn that money. So when you give in an offering, you are not putting money in. You are putting a part of you, a part of your life, of your time, of your talent into it. And I completely get that. And as your pastor, I want to say thank you for your generousness in following God and doing what he's asked us to do with finances. You know, as a church, we have plans. We would love to pay off our debt. So if you want to get your checkbook out, just kidding. 340-something thousand dollars, that's it now. That's it. That's it. We're half of when we started eight something years ago. We're trying to put more and more into the money market savings for future expansions. At the end of this year, because of your generosity and just basic faithfulness to God, just to let you know, at the end of the year, we were able to cut a check to go to the principal of our debt of $15,500 because of your generosity. We are also able to put $12,000 over into the money market at the end of this past year because of your generosity and because as a church we are planning to do what God has asked us to do and be good stewards of your giving. They exceeded the expectations. We're exceeding the expectations. Verse 5. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. I want us to look today at the grace of giving. Verse 1, there's a little phrase, the grace that God has given us. In your notes, if you're new with us, I'm a note taker type person, and I make you take notes just so you stay awake, just to let you know. So if you start to nod off, look at your notes, and you fill in the blank. I heard this phrase a little while back, and every time I think about it or hear it, it, it inspires me when blessings come my way. It's this. It is all from God, and it is all for God. It is all from God. It is all for God. All of it. When we start this journey of maybe resetting how we think about finances, what helps us is to understand that I have never given God anything. Because he has given it all to me in the first place. All I am doing is giving it back. All I am doing 
is returning it to the one who has blessed me in the first place. Deuteronomy 8.18 is a great little passage. It says, it is God who gives you the ability to produce well. Well, hold on, Pastor Brian. <clears throat> I'm the one that went and studied to get this degree to get me this job that pays really well. And I'm the one that does the 40 plus hours of work. And I know that I'm the one that comes up with the great ideas. Okay. Who makes your heart beat 100,000 times a day? Who makes your brain fire through those little things up there to make you think? Who causes you to breathe every breath that you take, every move that you make? Every bond you break, every step. I told myself I wasn't going to go there, but I went there. But honestly, everything that we do and we are is His. It is all from God. It is all for God. He owns it all. My job, your job, is to steward it. To steward his grace. Let me give you a definition of grace. There in your notes, write this down. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Maybe you've heard that before. It's what salvation is. Not only does God pay the penalty for our sin, our, our sin debt... So now that we are free spiritually, the Bible also says that his righteousness is credited to our account. There's this full transfer so that when we stand before God at the judgment, you're not judged for the sins of your life because they have been paid for. You have been forgiven. They have been wiped away. The Father is going to see the righteousness of his Son in you. That's amazing. To understand that spiritual transaction. But I believe it's more than just a spiritual transaction. 2 Corinthians 9.11. In your notes it says this. You will be enriched in every way. Say every way. Every way. So that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. You know why God blesses you? You know why God has given things into your life? He has enriched you so that in all things, at all times, you can have a generous spirit and a generous heart for every occasion of your life. It's really not that complicated. Hard to do, because we're selfish, all of us. But it's not that complicated. We are blessed so that we can bless others. And when God blesses you, you know what our challenge is for our culture? Well, God has blessed me with this job that pays me an extra $30,000. Guess what we're going to do? We're going to expand way out of sorts how we live. Maybe we need to expand our generosity as well. I'm not saying you have to live the same your entire life. I'm saying as God blesses you, understand he is blessing you to also bless others. One of the most amazing churches I've, I've heard about is in India. The poorest part of the country... <clears throat> Uh, most of the people live on about a dollar a day. Extreme poverty, but in that extreme poverty, this church has welled up with rich generosity. The tradition that this church goes by started in 1910. We'll get to that tradition in a moment. But they are a modern-day Macedonian church who last year gave $13 million to missions. And over the last century, they have sent out 1,800 missionaries. It goes back to this tradition that this church started in 1910. I don't know who had the idea, but it's a great idea. In this day and time, the, 
the, the meals consisted mainly of rice as a primary source of food. So every time that they would eat rice, they would get a, give a cup full of rice to the church. The principle is very simple. If you have something to eat, you have something to give. And through that, over the years, they understand that God has blessed them and that because God is supplying and blessing them, that they can be the hands, the feet, and help meet the needs of those that are around them. One of our core values as a church is to love people. Love God, love people, serve the world. Love people when they least expect it. Love people when they least deserve it. Something happens when you begin to love people when you don't feel like it. Isn't that true? Now, some of you just thought of somebody. That person, that mmm, that mmm, and, and mmm, and mmm. That's with you trying not to say bad words. Mm. That's what you're doing. To love somebody that doesn't deserve it. That's a sacrifice of love. To come in on Sundays and to worship God and you just don't feel like it. It's a sacrifice of praise. And what I've discovered in my life that breakthroughs happen when I'm willing to sacrifice, to be a blessing, to give out of maybe what I see as poverty, something powerful happens in our lives. I don't care how much you have or how, much, or how little you have. That is not the standard. Don't make that an excuse. If you have something, you bring it to the table and allow it to make a difference in someone's life. You know, if you look in Scripture, it's interesting that the most applauded giver in all of Scripture just had a few little coins. Luke 21, this is Jesus. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, Jesus is telling us, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty, but in all she had to live on. The greatest giver, it's not about how much you have. It might be about how much you keep and sacrificing to the Lord. Put this in your notes. This is what I recommend. Sow a seed at a point in need. Now, there's a reason I kind of hesitated thinking about this one because there are many who have abused this. You can look online. You can look on other media outlets, and there are people who rip people off with this kind of concept I hope you know that you can trust this church body, but sow a seed. Do something generous in your points of needs in life. I've seen people who are struggled with depression and just feeling down and, and lonely and just feel like no one cares. You know what I've encouraged them to do? Go be kind to somebody else. Go do something generous for somebody else. Take that little bit of energy that you have left in your soul that it feels like and get out beyond yourself and go and just love on. You know what that does? It adds joy to the equation of that person's life. Because it is more blessed to give, we're just not talking about money, to give than it is to receive. And the same thing happens with our finances. The Bible says that the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know what that's saying? For fun, in our digital age, wouldn't it be great if we could have the transcript of this past week's conversations? And we'll put them up on the big screen, and we'll read what everybody said this week. That would be so much fun, wouldn't it? If 
if you want to get an x-ray of how you're doing in life, just get a transcript of your words. In the same sense, finances, money reveals what's in our hearts. Jesus says where your money is, that's where your heart will be. So if our words, they're an x-ray of how we're doing, maybe we're going to suggest that the money, the finances in your life is an MRI. It reveals the internal condition of our hearts. Look at verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. We don't give to get. The Bible says it's, I'll be happier if I give than receive. That means God's going to do something for me. That means I'm going to get something back. We don't give to get. If your motive in giving, if being generous is to get something back from God, good luck. God is not a slot machine. God will not be played. And to be honest, the least rewarding thing we receive from God really is finances in our life. His blessings go so much beyond money. Peace and, and joy and relationships restored and and health, and grace, and mercy, and provision. His, his blessings go way beyond the cash in your wallet. What I've learned, what many of you have told me as well in your life, you can't outgive God. When you give, you discover that God begins to provide things within your finances, and your finances kind of take on this supernatural dimension of your life. I understand that sometimes tough financial straits happen in our lives. Cash and I, we have been there as well. Over the years, there's been moments where you're pinching pennies, and, and you wonder if this next paycheck is going to cover all the bills. Early on, we were married, both in school. Great American Cookie Company was her job. Lowe's was my job. If it wasn't for the generosity of people in our lives, in those moments where you go, thank you, Lord. But from the very beginning of our marriage, we knew that to tithe or not to tithe wasn't even a question. We knew that it was an expression of our faith to God. There are moments you have to step out. There are moments you have to step out in obedience to God's word and do your very best to honor God in every area of your life. And that includes what we do with the finances God has blessed us with. I've seen it before, I've heard it before, I know it for truth. 90% with God's blessings is so much better than 100% without. Because let me warn you, if you start to become a generous person, now here's a warning, you've got to be careful. You'll become addicted to it. A positive addiction in your life. Yesterday. Do you remember how it was warm on Friday? <clears throat> yesterday wasn't, was it? Do you remember the wind that blew yesterday? It was great, wasn't it? Fresh, clean out the sinuses. You know, we talked about physical resets last Sunday. <laughs> Cassie has been running for a little while. She's like, I'm going to go run. You are? Okay, I'll go with you. My brain was thinking the nice weather from Friday. We get out there. <clears throat> -hoo 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 -hoo, baby, it's cold. I mean, that wind is whipping through anything I tried to put on. Whew. Now, she did most of the running. I kind of walked and would jog a little bit. And she, 
I'd catch up when she passed me back that way. It was that type of thing. Physical reset, doing our very best. But something happens even for those who are runners, runners. And if you run in the cold just because something's wrong with you, but, but there's something that happened while I was walking slash running. <sighs> Oxygen felt better. I could breathe a little bit more. I was like, I can do this, this little second wind of, it's called a runner's high. For those who are sports people and runners, they do this and they go out and run because they know that at some point through the pain, there's going to be this moment. And it's this second burst of energy. It's this positive addiction in their life. Being generous, let me tell you, that is a positive addiction we all need in our lives because when you bless somebody boy it does something to you when you're generous something small or something big let's do our best at that verse 7 look at that again but since you excel in everything you excel in faith you excel in speech you excel in knowledge you excel in complete earnestness and you excel in the love we have kindled in you see that you also excel in this grace of giving. There are things that people do to become wealthy. There's, there's articles out there. Some read all the time. Some, some don't watch much TV. Some get up three hours before they go to work, and they're, they're, they're going all the time. I even saw some articles that said that most who are really, really wealthy in our country had a paper route at some point in their life. So if you're struggling, go get a paper route. Seems to be a solution. Probably teaches work ethic, probably teaches good people skills, all that kind of stuff. But I don't want you to become wealthy if it becomes your greatest liability. I would never pray God's blessings and wealth upon you if you don't know how to steward it. Because I've seen it before. Not handling the blessings that God puts in our lives can be one of the crushing moments in a person's life. There's a little phrase in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I won't look at it it's verbatim, but it pretty much says, being ready to give. Being ready to give, to look for those opportunities to give. Last thing in your notes, I want you to fill this in. Flip the blessing. Let me ask you, where have you been blessed in your life? How have you been blessed? Who? Who has blessed you? What has God brought into your life that you do not deserve? That is the very place where you need to flip the blessing. For those who are leading us in worship, just come on up. Let me give you an example. When I was in college, I was part of Campus Choir, one of the ministry choirs that traveled. Spring break, fall breaks, different churches, ministering to people. Most fun times of my life. Let me tell you what would happen a few times on these tours. We would stay in the homes of people like we've done here. Or maybe be after a service and then there'd be a gentleman or a lady. They'd come up and they'd say, oh, they'd shake my hand. And we just, just so glad you came and they'd shake my hand. Now I've heard some people call it a Pente- Pentecostal handshake. I don't know if that's where it originated from or not. But when I would open up my hand, there was cash in my hand. College student. Lived on Raymond Noodles one spring break. Cash in my hand? The blessing for me as a college student to survive? Let me tell you, those people, I don't remember who they were, what they even looked like. But those people made an impact on my life. So you know what I do when we have people, groups come in? I intentionally try to shake a hand put some cash in one of those poor, miserable college students 
to flip a blessing that's been in my life. Maybe you were a waiter or a waitress at one point in your life and someone gave you this incredible tip. Today, if you go out, maybe today's the day. Flip the blessing. Maybe you've gone out and you ask your waiter or waitress, uh, uh, we're ready for our ticket, and they go, oh, well, someone's already paid for it. What? What? And you look around, see who you recognize. You don't see anybody. Flip the blessing. Let's be honest. I'm right in the boat with you. I miss more opportunities than I seize. I can come up with a few stories and say, oh, Pastor Brian, no, I miss so much more. But there's one time that sticks out in my mind. I was eating lunch at Jalapenos. Mmm, good food. And something, sometimes God just plants something in your heart with the people around you. There was something about that waitress. And I was like, God, are you sure about this tip you're putting in my heart? B-I-G, big tip for me. It was one of those where I had to text Cassie. Cassie, this is what I think God is telling me to do for this tip. Are you okay with this? I had to get confirmation from confirming God's word to me. Be a blessing. Flip the blessings that have happened in your life. I don't care if they are big or they are small. Excel in the grace of giving. I want people to say about me when my time has done a bunch of different things, but one of the things I want them to say, man, Ryan was just generous. 